All right, well, this morning <clears throat> we are continuing the book of Romans. We're almost done. And what we have here is a list of the many people who worked hard in serving the Lord in His kingdom and in many ways uh, benefited Paul, but not just Paul, but, but one another. So as I read this list, I, I do want you to notice the one thing that Paul commends these believers for. And uh, what he's doing is he's sending his greetings and his commendations to many people that, whose names, uh, this is the only place they appear in Scripture, with the exception, of course, of, of some, but particularly Priscilla and Aquila. And the fact that she's called here Prisca rather than Priscilla does not mean it's somebody different. It's just a different variation of her name. But let's just take in the whole picture, and then we'll look at um, mainly uh, Priscilla and Aquila, but just you know, make some mention of these other names as well. So, Paul writes this in his letter. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Also greet the church that is in their house. Greet Epinatus, my beloved, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my <clears throat> fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Greet Apellus, the approved in Christ, Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patropus, Hermas, and the brethren with them. Greet Philogelus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our um, understanding this morning and, and to encourage us uh, to follow the many examples that the Lord has um, recorded here for our encouragement. Now, uh, let me just again remind you that Paul has been giving us several examples of what we're talking about this morning, loving service, service expressed to others, again, motivated by love. So far, we've seen that of the <laughs> Macedonians and the uh, Achaeans who sacrificed to give to the needy saints in Jerusalem and who prayed for Paul that he might be delivered uh, from Christ's enemies as he delivered that gift to them. We've seen Paul's example. And I think Paul, you know, besides the Lord Jesus Christ, I think Paul is our greatest example, who not only risked his life when he took this gift to, to Jerusalem, but who was constantly willing to put his life on the line, both for the Lord and his people, as he continually pushed forward into new territory with the gospel. You know, Paul was someone who worked hard, who, you know, tirelessly labored. And he did it from, you know, from his own words, he did it because he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constrains me. But he also said there were times when he didn't necessarily feel that love, but he knew it was his duty. He knew it was a stewardship entrusted to him, and he knew that he still had to do it, even if he didn't feel like doing it because that is what the Lord called him to do. We saw Christ's example, who gave up, and again, we just saw that in Philippians 2, who gave up the riches of heaven to become poor, to become one with us, to take the, the obligation to obey the law. He did that for us so that he might obey it for us, but also to take our curse upon himself and to die on the cross in our place so that he might take those who were poor, I mean absolutely poor in the sense that we were on our way 
to a crisis eternity, to perdition, to suffer forever. And He has made us rich. He has made us His own children, His brothers and sisters, the, the children of the Heavenly Father, and we will be with Him forever. His entire life on earth was that of service to His Father and to the saints. That's why Jesus came. But you know, even now in heaven, He continues to serve us as He intercedes for us uh, according to the will of God. And of course, we saw last week that example of Phoebe, that servant, that deacon, that deaconess of the church of Cancrea, who had blessed many of the saints by her service, and Paul, as she was the courier who took his letter to Rome. Now, this morning, we see Paul's greetings and commendations to the saints in Rome. And what's interesting here for our purposes is that for which he commends them, their service, their hard work for the kingdom of heaven. One thing I want us to note about this list, and I've already told you, but I want to remind you. And really, it's, it's probably the same point whenever there's a list given and not really much information given about them. And that is that God uses ordinary people to accomplish His purposes. He doesn't, you know, I mean, yes, there were great, you know, great preachers that God has raised up. There are some that today that are great preachers and maybe not like some of the, the, those in the past. I mean, there are always those shining lights like the Apostle Paul, George Whitfield, and so forth that, that are outstanding theologians who are outstanding. By the way, I should include uh, Charles Spurgeon, one of the great preachers that God has, has given to the church. And they've done a lot of good. But most of the work is done by those who have ordinary gifts, just simply serving the Lord. Okay? And that's what we need to see, that those are the kinds of people, people like us, that God uses to build His kingdom, okay? So what I'd like to do this morning is to spend most of our time looking at Priscilla and Aquila uh, because, again, what was, you know, who were they? Um, just people that wanted to make a difference, and they did what they could, and what they did made a big difference. But so did the rest of these. So first of all, let's consider Priscilla and Aquila. Paul writes in verses 3 and 4. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Now again, since we know more about them, we're going to spend a little bit more time with them. So what do we know about Aquila and Priscilla? Well, first of all, we know from Luke's account in the book of Acts that Aquila was a native of Pontus, now, if I were to ask you, do you know where Pontus is? You know, if I asked you to raise your hand, would you be able to raise your hand? This is an area we don't really read much about in Scripture. But if you can think about a map of the Mediterranean and you can see in your mind where Turkey is or Galatia, okay? Pontus is that area just north of Galatia that borders on the Black Sea, which is up here. The Mediterranean down here, Turkey right here, Black Sea up here. So Pontus is up here. Now, Luke doesn't tell us whether Priscilla was from Pontus, but certainly Aquila was. It's likely that that's where Aquila met Priscilla and where they got married. It's also possible, certainly, that it happened in Rome. Uh, Paul first met Aquila and Priscilla in, in Corinth shortly after he had arrived there when he came from Athens. Now, remember, Paul's making his round through the main cities of the Roman Empire, and he's trying to plant churches there so that the gospel may continue to sound out uh, to everyone because, you know, people come to those places a lot. So he comes to Corinth from Athens where he had just made his great speech to the philosophers on Mars Hill and really saw very little effect. But then in Corinth, sees were really quite a bit more. But, the, but they, Aquila and Priscilla, also had, had come there recently, we're told, because Claudius Caesar had expelled all the Jews from Rome, and Aquila and Priscilla were Jewish. Now, that happened around 49 to 50 AD, and Claudius ordered the Jews out of Rome because of the riots, the riots that were being allegedly uh, stirred up and instituted by Crestus which is believed to be a reference to Christ. 
Now, we know that Jesus was not physically in Rome, but his followers were there. And the Jews apparently got into some heated debates with them over who Jesus actually was. Now, that kind of gives us a little bit of a, a hint as to what the, the uh, Roman Christians were doing. They were interacting with people, even people that um, would get a little bit upset with what they had to say. I mean, there were riots that, to the point where Claudius said, all right, I'm, I'm done with you Jews, just everyone get out. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you know, leave, it doesn't matter. Well, so that is what forced them to come to Corinth, but of course that was the Lord's plan, and he had a purpose for that. Aquila and Priscilla, because they shared the same trade as the Apostle Paul, that of making tents, Paul stayed and he worked with them. You know, it, it is interesting that every Jewish child, regardless of their financial status, regardless of their social status and that of their parents, they were all taught a trade. They were all taught a way uh, to make a living. Uh, that was true even of the rabbis. Uh, so it was true even of the Apostle Paul. Rabbi was not his only profession. He also had a trade. And this, this, I think you probably understand, this is where we get the term tent maker. You know, when missionaries can't legally enter into a country as missionaries, or maybe when they don't have the support they need in order to, um, you know, make ends meet while they're there, they go into the country by vocationally. They take on a full or a part-time job to support themselves, and then they do their missionary work with their remaining time. And there's also a, a third option, uh, and that would be um, people who go in to do this work, but they, they go in uh, kind of to, you know, what do I want to say, um, interact with people through the vocation that they're actually going in to do. I mean, sometimes you can teach English, and in teaching English, you can use Christian literature and um, maybe interact with people on that Christian literature. But your vocation then would be maybe uh, that of a teacher. So sometimes that's necessary. Uh, sometimes the missionary doesn't have the support. Sometimes they can't go in as missionaries. Sometimes they have to go in this way. Well, Paul, um, we read in Scripture, he worked whenever he did missionary work. He worked to take care of his own needs. He also worked to take care of the needs of those with him. And it's not because he had to do that, but it's because he wanted to do that. First of all, he wanted to provide an example of giving. See, Paul, just incredibly gifted by the Lord, not only with zeal and love for Christ, but with incredible energy. But he says in Acts 20, verses 33 through 35, to the Ephesian elders, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So you notice Paul, he didn't want to be on the receiving end, really, in, in, in any way, except, of course, what he needed from, from the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he needed salvation. He needed the strength. He needed everything to do what he was called to do through him. But when it came to his people, he did not want to be a burden upon them. He didn't want to be supported by them. He wanted to give to them. He also wanted to be able to offer the gospel freely wherever he went without it costing the people who heard. He writes in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 18, What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge. Notice, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So he wanted to offer the gospel freely. Now, the one thing that was interesting about Paul is that's not what Christ commanded him to do. As a matter of fact, Christ commanded that those who labor in the gospel actually get their living from the gospel. We read again in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7, and verses 3 through 14. Who at any time serves as a soldier 
at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat of the food of the temple? And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. So that was the Lord's command that those who labor be supported. But in Paul's case, he says, I wanted to offer the gospel without charge so that not to make full use of my right in the gospel. And I think, as I recall, I, I don't have the passage here, but I believe he also says so that his enemies would not accuse him of trying to get rich off of you know, doing this work, although I can't imagine, but you know, enemies slander in any way that they can. Paul did not get rich. He lived a very laborious life and, as we know, a life of tremendous hardship for the sake of the gospel. Now, there is a question of whether Priscilla and Aquila were actually believers when Paul first met them or whether they were converted by Paul's ministry. And I, as I look at this, I think it seems quite likely that they were already believers. I think Aquila and maybe Priscilla, uh, who you know, was from Pontus, um, that they might possibly have been in Jerusalem at the time of uh, Pentecost. Remember, as we look at the list in Acts 2, 9, where it talks about the differing dialects of the people who were, you know, heard them speaking, uh, some of these were from Pontus, which means that Aquila, uh, Priscilla could have been there. It's also possible that when those Jews who were from Pontus, who were converted and discipled, uh, returned to Pontus, that in their evangelizing and sharing the gospel, that Aquila and Priscilla were converted uh, by them. I think the fact that Paul joins with them to make tents also seems to support this, since we nowhere read that he made any effort to evangelize them. I think rather seeing that they shared the same trade and the same faith, he saw in them those who would help him do the real work, you know, which is that of the kingdom. So what exactly did Aquila and Priscilla do for the kingdom? Well, we do know that when Paul finally left Corinth after 18 months, I mean, when Paul got there, he met Aquila and Priscilla, which means he labored with them for these 18 months. Aquila and Priscilla continued with Paul when he left, and they traveled with him to Ephesus, and they remained there. We read in Acts 18, verses 18 through 19, Paul put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Cancrea, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there, while Paul continued on to Syria. So what did Aquila and Priscilla do while they were in Ephesus? Well, they opened their house to, uh, to serve the church, for one thing. But it was also here that Apollos came and preached, remember. And when they heard him, they understood this, this is a, a great preacher, a great man of God, but he's lacking something. He doesn't seem to understand the full picture. He only knew about Christ through the preaching of John the Baptist. And so we read that they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Uh, that phrase, they took him aside, doesn't mean, you know, that Apollos was preaching to a crowd and they said, you know, just kind of took him into a corner and, and kind of helped him out. But what it means is they took him into their home and they spent some time with him, okay? And there they shared with him everything they understood from their time with the Apostle Paul about the Lord Jesus Christ. They discipled him. They, they equipped him. They, they helped him, again, understand the full picture so that being fortified with that knowledge, he went across to Corinth, where they had just come from, and there he helped the disciples and powerfully refuted the Jews, proving that Jesus was the Christ. Now here, again, another example. Aquila and Priscilla, we don't read that they were great communicators, that Aquila was a great preacher or evangelist. But we do read that they helped somebody who was. You know, you ever think about um, the person 
the Lord used to lead Charles Spurgeon to himself. Somebody who was supplying the pulpit on that particular occasion because the heavy snow, I guess it was, didn't allow him to get there. Somebody had to fill in at the last minute. He's struggling to be able to get a message out. And as he's struggling, you know, Spurgeon didn't go to the church that he was going to go to. He ends up diverting to this place. Here's this man preach. And the Lord speaks to him through those words. And he's converted. And we know the rest is history. He was prodigious in the amount that he was able to produce, how he worked hard for the Lord. And Spurgeon said that even though he destroyed his constitution, his physical health by laboring for Christ, he said, if I had a hundred constitutions to destroy for him, I would do it. Okay? So that was his goal. That was his purpose in life. But, but again, how does Spurgeon come to know Christ through this Lonely servant of the Lord Jesus, an ordinary servant of the Lord Jesus, and Aquila and Priscilla pretty much did the same, but they equipped somebody who could do more, and so they would, through their labors, enter into his labors and share in his reward. We may not have great gifts. We may not be able to do a lot, but if we do what we can, we don't know exactly how the Lord might use that. Well, as I've said, while they were in Ephesus, they also opened their home to the church for worship. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, the churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So they, they not only opened their house to, you know, uh, Apollos, but they also opened it to the church. We see they were very hospitable. And when Paul wrote this letter to, to the Romans, we see that they were now in Rome, where they again opened their house to the church. Paul writes in Romans 16, verse 5, greet the church that is in their house. So again, just, just trying to be useful, just trying to use what they had to serve the Lord. So then they later returned to Ephesus, where when Paul is writing to Timothy in, in what's considered to be his last letter before he is executed in his second Roman imprisonment, he says to Timothy, greet Aquila and, and Priscilla. Paul also says in our text that they risk their lives for him. They, they risk their necks, which means they put their life on the line. You know, back in those days, execution by beheading was not uncommon. When you risk your neck, that means you risk being beheaded, okay? Well, um, they risked their lives in their service for Paul. Now, we don't know exactly when that happened. It could have been when they were with him in Corinth and that insurrection took place when the Jews dragged Paul before the judgment seat of Gallio. It might be that Quilla and Priscilla were also in danger at that time, or maybe at Ephesus. They were also there with him when Demetrius stirred up the craftsmen against Paul because he was preaching against idolatry. And remember how that affected the, the business of the craftsmen. They, they couldn't sell their idols because Paul was converting too many people to Christianity. Or it could have been in some other situation that Luke doesn't tell us about, but they risked their lives for the gospel. So it's no wonder when we consider all of these things that Paul calls them his fellow workers in Christ. Because... He wasn't the only one who benefited from their service, but he tells us all the Gentile churches also benefited. You know, I'm sure that that's probably a bit of hyperbole. We do know that Corinth was blessed, Ephesus was blessed, Rome was blessed because they were there. They opened up their home. Maybe he's thinking about Apollos' ministry there or how people were affected in these different metropolitan centers, how they helped promote that work, and so through that became a blessing to all the Gentile churches. Now, I'm sure that Aquila and Priscilla didn't uh, set out necessarily to have this kind of an impact. They, they just simply wanted to honor the Lord, the Lord who saved them, and to return the love that He had shown them by loving His people and by doing what they could to promote His work. And again, really, that's all the Lord calls us to do, is to do what we can to promote His work. Now, I want to close by taking a brief look at some of these other names very briefly. 
Paul writes Greek, uh, and listen, as we, as we read these, um, again, note what it is that Paul commends them for. Paul writes, greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. You know, the only thing we know about Mary is she was a hard worker. Greet Andronicus and Junius. Paul calls them kinsmen, not, not likely because they were directly related to him, you know, by, you know, his, his immediate family, but that they were Jewish believers. And they were imprisoned also, fellow prisoners, because of the gospel. And this may be why they were well known to the apostles. So they are also risking their necks for Christ. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. Apelles, the approved in Christ. Approved means to be tested and to be found genuine. Tryphena and Tryphosa, workers in the Lord. Persis, the beloved, who has worked hard in the Lord. Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. By the way, just as an interesting historic note, Rufus is the son of Simon, the Simon who carried Jesus' cross. We, we believe from the scriptural account that Simon, who may have been enlisted at that time, he may not have been a disciple. He eventually did become a disciple of Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me, at some point, he shared his faith with, with his son, Rufus, and Rufus followed in the footsteps of his father in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Paul calls Rufus' mother his mother, he doesn't mean that Rufus is his brother uh, in a physical sense, but he's probably practicing what he also told Timothy that he should do in 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 and 2. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father. To the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. So if she's a mother, she's in the Lord, she's Paul's mother. If she's a younger woman, that's my sister. Older man, that's my father. Younger man, that's my brother. This is the body of Christ. Okay, so again, Paul is reflecting on that familial relationship we have with one another. But again, let's notice what he commends them for, their hard work. He then closes the section with a few honorable mentions and a blanket greeting to cover the rest. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the brethren with them. Greet Philogolus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Paul tells Titus that Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds, Titus 2.14. He wrote to the Ephesians, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jesus said to the twelve, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. And Jesus said, The one who serves him the most is the one who will be the most honored. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So let's be encouraged by Christ's example. Let's be encouraged by the examples given to us by the Apostle Paul in this letter to do what the Lord has made us and saved us to do, to serve him, okay, to serve him in our worship, to serve Him in our prayers, to serve Him in our giving, to serve Him in our sharing of the gospel with others. And let's also be encouraged from this to serve each other in ministering our gifts, encouraging one another, helping, praying for one another, giving to meet each other's needs, and showing hospitality. 
remembering what the author to the Hebrews writes, and I'll close with this, with this passage in Hebrews 6, verses 10 through 12. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Well, may the Lord help us to take all these things into account as we set our hearts to serve Him. Let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we?